thank you very much. And, and as I said, uh, before we use the data, we need to also access the data. And, and that's one of the discussions that the uh, working group on big data of the ITF uh, was working. I will give a very short presentation on behalf of the working group, uh, highlighting just a couple of points. Um, Alex, a question to you, whether this paper, the background paper that you have prepared will be shared with the participant as well, because I think there would be some very useful insights to that and, and adding to the chapter on the, how you lift the barriers to data sharing as well coming from the discussions and hearing some of the participants already mentioning this as a, as a very important point. Yes, yeah, the, the, the paper will be circulated as part of the draft report. Perfect, perfect. So <clears throat> again, uh, not, nothing new on this background to the, the, the work of the working group. Uh, there are a lot of uh, the private sector that collects much of the big data and access to this type of data would really improve planning and regulation, but also reducing the survey cost, as Patricia was mentioning in the beginning of, of the intervention. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, new opportunities for transport policy making through big and open data. Uh, and and one of the work that our colleague Philip Chris has done here is also looking at the potential shift in regulatory function of governments, how you could move to a data driven policy making. So monitoring and enforcing the legislation at the same time. Uh, but in order to do all that, we need public-private partnerships for data sharing. And we did have a working group uh, uh, two years ago looking at this question. And um, we were very pleased to have Patricia who to chair this working group as well. Participation from several countries uh, or international organizations with the objective really to help the member countries in, in leveraging the big data, looking at what are the quality standards that you use to communicate the, the, the big and open data. And I can see that from the background papers that some of these discussions will be coming back in the, in the following two days, but also what could be the framework to facilitate the data sharing between public and private sectors. Now, when we talk about quality standards. Um, OECD has done a quality standard uh, um, framework, really. It looks at relevance, which is ability of the, of the data to answer our questions. Looks at accuracy, how well the data actually estimates the values we want to have. It looks at credibility, so what is the objectivity of the data, the timeliness, that the data is actually not obsolete at the time it's been published. We look at the accessibility, which means how available the data, and not only the data, but also the metadata are for the researchers, for the users of the data itself. The interpretability, um, whether or not the dimensions or dimensions of the data uh, are well defined in the data sets, and coherence, um, the, the terms and methods uh, of data need to remain consistent really uh, within the data across the multiple data sets and over time for us to be able to make comparisons and continue working on these data sets. So this is sort of the, the overall uh, data quality standards of the OECD that have been put forward for all the statistics and data. And, and in the working group, the group looked at the standards versus the big data. And I'm sure there are a lot of opinions about this and, and it would be obviously very useful to, to hear your views on, on where the benefits and challenges of the big data are. But I think if we start from the, from the benefits of relevance, the big data really allows researchers to study topics that previously could not be necessarily explored or be theorized, but actually through exp extrapolation only. Uh, the challenge there is that uh, big data tends to lack information needed to, let's say, effectively respond to research objectives. These, these are variables like social demographic variables, metadata, et cetera, et cetera. So there are pros and cons. And as you see it, when you go down the list, we have the both for pretty much all of them. In terms of accuracy, uh, the big data is more, more precise and, and it's detailed than even before. And, and there's a big, um, maybe not fully no human errors, but a lot of the human errors in data manipulation and inputs can be removed from the big data. Uh, at the same time, on the challenge side on the accuracy, the evaluation of the statistical validity of the results quite often have to be adapted to a particular case of big data. 
on terms of credibility, um, the group didn't really come up for major benefits. Uh, but, but in terms of challenges, uh, the group did identify that much of the big data does lack some of the scientific rigor and objectivity, which renders some of the credibility of, uh, questionable. Uh, this is probably mostly because of the complexities of developing different types of methods for big data for such an analysis. On the timeliness, there are obviously huge benefits with, uh, with the big data. The data is being collected at faster rates than ever before. It, it describes the, uh, the phenomenon we study at the immediate, uh, immediate phase. Uh, but also maybe there's a downside to that, that the data becomes out of date also faster than ever before. While it's available fast, it becomes outdated, um, uh, which is a challenge, which is really inspiring uh, great innovation, I think, in analytical methods. And, and I think we'll be hearing some of these points in the, in the following presentations as well. On terms of accessibility, uh, a huge benefit for big data can be quickly or almost instantaneously collected uh, and accessed in, in certain cases, not in all cases, but in many cases. Uh, but on the side of the accessibility challenges, um, metadata and the collection methods themselves can be confidential. They can be very costly to obtain uh, and assuming in the first place that there has been a, a proper documentation of these approaches uh, in place. Uh, a big question on interpretability of the big data. Um, in cases where the variable, variables needed are available and accessible, the level of detail of big data can really facilitate our interpretation for about the topic we're looking at and allow much more precise um, understanding of the population of interest or the sample of interest. I think there's a major benefit of big data. In terms of the challenges though, um, especially from uh, some of the devices or social media side, the big data is missing information on the sample population. Uh, as, as before, the relevance can also lack some of the social demographic variables that need to be needed, are normally needed to really make a sound statistical extrapolations of these data. And uh, it can be also difficult to find data with the variables needed to guide policy decisions, as there's a little control over what information actually is being collected. So, so the link to the policy making is extremely important here in the interpolativity side as well. And finally, in terms of the coherence of the big data, um, there is a potential facility in comparing this big data with between countries or, or, do, or do the similar structures of sources. So we talk about Google Maps, uh, mobile phones that really allow us to compare huge amount of data across the countries or across the phenomena we're looking at. But again, in terms of coherence, the challenge is that um, there really is uh, often a lack of procedures in place that would um, ensure the consistent collection and documentation of big data. And uh, in many cases, the compilation of setting up these procedures is really due to the fluctuation particular to big data. And, and in terms of really the continuity of, of the work and, and the analysis we do with the big data, there is this big question of coherence. So again, these are some of the challenges very shortly summarized in one table and, and also the benefits in the paper, the background document that my colleagues Alex and Eric have put together. I will share with you there are a little bit more details of each one of these and, and will allow you to comment afterwards and as part of the summary document of, the, of this round table. Now, as part of the, the working group, uh, the group did uh, several uh, explored several case studies of data sharing, um, looking at existing examples across the different countries and different um, types of data sharing. Uh, we had several cases from Canada. We looked at rail and trucking way bill work, fuel consumption survey in Finland, the Nordic Way project and the Aurora project. There's no point for us for me to go through all of these by names. There'll be an annex tabled in the, in the summary document that shows what were the kind of questions that were asked in these and how, how these were analyzed. Uh, in also, uh, the group itself carried out several stakeholder interviews, which were very useful to trying to understand the reasons and, and, and sort of experiences that we have today with, the, with data sharing and uh, approaches to that. 
And these interviews were structured. So they were same for all the countries and all the, all the interviews carried out. They were looking at experience with existing partnership in terms of what was the type of partnership, what was the structure, what were the benefits for both parties, what were the general attitudes towards the partnership from the private sector specifically. Uh, was there a specific third party set up for the data sharing? Uh, what was the value proposition for, for these? And, and what type of data were actually shared? We're, and also looking at what was the ownership structure? What was the approach to sharing? What was the level of detail? What were the underlying conditions? Were there, uh, were there uh, specific ag agreements about resharing the data? How was the data disseminated? And were they actually made openly available after the, the agreements? And, and we had uh, six, six specific interviews from five different countries looking at, looking at these examples. So just a couple of highlights, and, and I do have to turn back to the chair. Pat, help me out here. If I'm missing some key elements of the, of the working group, reflecting the work you did also with the ITF on this one. Some of the observations coming from these interviews and case studies, the first thing we did get from, from the participants who were mainly from government, official, of government officials, that all of them felt that uh, the new models for public private data sharing and the partnership are really indispensable. This is something we need to work on and we need to find a ways of going forward to that. But at the same time, a big acknowledgement that there are several types of partnerships existing already today ranging from a large scale data dumps as part of a, a survey to commercial schemes or fixed term projects. And, and they all had different settings. They were either very short fixed research project, they were part of a lot broader business development activities or even mandatory data sharing schemes. Uh, and, and one of the observations we had, which, is, which goes back to the relevance of the big data, open data for long-term decision-making is that at the moment, what we saw a, a couple of years ago in this working group, most of these models, most of these experiences are temporary, have been so far. They have been limited duration, they're pilot projects, the access to data is only for a period of time. So how do we maintain this kind of activity on a longer term that supports the policy decision-making is, is really a key question here. And data typically in all the cases we looked at was only shared between the parties that were involved because of the data protection and privacy issues. So it was still a, a, almost like a really partnership between two, two partners only and, and the broader value for public data sharing was not there in most of the cases we looked at. Um, and so some of the recommendations these are very high level. Again, in the, in the report, there'll be more, more discussions on these and, and with, with your support and, and, and comments, I'm sure this can be even further sharpened for the, for the summary of this round table. Uh, but one of the key points that the participants in the working group did say and, and recommended that the government should try to make any data received more widely open. There is a public value for having these data available and, and keeping them close between the two partners is not necessarily um, the ideal solution or, or, or outcome. Uh, at the same time, there's a big question on the compliance with the privacy protection regulation. And so before sharing further, the anonymization, the encryption of data, these are all, of course, important points. Uh, one of the things that came from the surveys and discussions with the, with the partners and, and um, interviews was that especially for location data or trajectory data, there's a really need to be to apply the most robust protection methods, as these are quite often the most vulnerable data where individuals can be tracked and, and can be having a harmful um, impact on, on them as well. Building trust is important. There were several ways of doing that. Um, the group put forward a few of those non disclosure agreements, which could be developed and endorsed. Um, involving a trusted third party, the so-called honest broker in, in this case, or, or developing other safe answers approaches, such as only um, exchanging the uh, query results instead of the whole raw data, and so on and so forth. And I, I know from the papers coming up again, there are quite a few examples of different approaches to this, and I really look forward to discussion on, on these as well. 
And then that there's no one partnership model really existing. There are several of them. And in the working group, we did identify certain steps of identifying what type of a, of a partnership model you should be using, but really depends on the data use and, and, and the type of data, and then the, how we use the data. Uh, three of them mentioned here, the offering actually to produce timely and open data in exchange, which based on the interviews and responses we received, really can make business, even the private business more efficient and more profitable uh, as, as we sharing the data. Um, financial compensation, obviously very important. This could allow companies to, to recover their investments made into the collecting of, of data or adapting the data for the government of public use itself. And would also address one of the key questions that came from the interviews was the free riding of other operators and other actors uh, on a company's investment into data collection. So the free riding uh, is obviously a, a big question here as well. And one third point is mandating. Mandate, mandating data, data sharing is one. Uh, the group was very strongly arguing that this should be only limited to data of, of, of public interest. And if we do mandate data sharing, it should really apply uh, the purpose specificity of that mandate. So it has to be specific to a purpose and, and you do need to apply uh, data minimi minimization principles to make sure that the burden for the data provider is not uh, significant. Again, uh, I think I'll turn to the chair to complement any of these. I hope this reflected at least partly to the to the presentation and the outcomes of the working group and uh, and I'd be happy to answer any questions or or turn to the chair for any questions you may have for the answers thank you very much